个坛。Think of this as a gift, so I will allow you to know now what you witnessed and felt. Was your future self laid bare? I obliterated time, then leapt beyond it. It doesn't matter who it is. I shall never allow any Cretan to threaten my eternal transcendence. Not ever. Jiro's Bizarre Adventure is known for a lot of things: the over-the-top nature, the odd humor. Or, in the case of this video, it's villains. A lot of JoJo's rogues gallery are some of the more iconic villains in anime. Will there be the vampire who's obsessed with the JoJo family, the serial killer who's obsessed with hands, or even the President of the United States of America? Never been prouder to be an American. Yes, I will talk about the President one day. Your comments have not been ignored. But today we're talking about one of the more overlooked villains of JoJo's Bizarre Adventure. Diavolo of Part 5. And to be frank, it's kind of hard not to see why, especially considering that his motivation, even in the series he's in, is nothing more than a man in the shadows, looking to be the king of the world, while at the same time not being known. It's actually logical if you think about it. If you're a well-known figure of a crime organization that allows people to rise up in the ranks by killing others, you essentially paint a target on your back. Of course, we're getting ahead of ourselves. Today we'll be diving deep into the man who burns his past away, a manga common, and prepare yourself. Now may the fires of hell embrace you. When you talk about JoJo villains, there's a lot you can glean from the characters, especially when we look at how Araki develops them. With Yoshikage Kira, he had elements of David Bowie for the design and elements of serial killers that Araki had researched. Dio was more or less inspired to be one of the worst villains of all time, not poorly written, mind you, but to be an evil bastard that the audience would love to hate. But for Diavolo, well, as much as I could, I couldn't find a lot of information on the development of Diavolo. Ironic. Maybe it's because I'm a lazy bastard and I couldn't find that little nugget of information about him, but the most I could find is this quote. It was shocking how, in the movie Total Recall, there was a guy with an extra face on his belly, with its own personality. For Diavolo, I thought he would look punk if his hair had a leopard pattern. That can't be it. Where's the rest of it? I like Total Recall as much as the next guy, but in all honesty, I really can't stretch that out for a good five minutes with this segment, so we'll do the next best thing. We'll establish who Diavolo is. <laughs> Diavolo is the main antagonist of Jojo Part 5, the boss of the Passione, the mafia that has its hands in several different kinds of crimes across Italy. He's also the founder of this organization, and it's an organization that specializes in secrecy, since if they were out in the open, that would make them targets of assassination and law enforcement. Considering that Diavolo is a man who values his privacy to an extreme manner, even to the point that he uses an actual alternate personality that causes physical changes, this works. It's actually an interesting thought process, since if you consider the nature of crimes and by extent the Mafia, working in the shadows and hiding your own power from prying eyes of authority makes sense with Diabolo's paranoia. Throw in the fact that the Passione has several stand users, of which their abilities cannot be seen by regular people, you can easily have your crimes be committed with your stand and most people wouldn't be none the wiser. I mean, even if a guy did explode outwards with a car. Our protagonist, Giorno Giovanna, does that in the opening of Part 5. So there is potential, and if we look towards the villains previously in JoJo, Diavolo actually continues a trend. If you really consider the actions and conditions for each of the villains of previous parts, they had a reason or another to hide at one point. Dio in part 1 had to hide his true motivations while he was human for years, and when he became a vampire and was defeated by Jonathan, he had to hide in order to recover. The Pillarmen, while I wouldn't say are cowardly, they had the same aversion to sunlight. In Dio Part 3, he had to recover and get used to his new body, all the while keeping himself hidden from the Joe Stars while he trained for, you know, using the world. And Kira in Part 4, well, I don't think I have to say anything about this guy, if you know anything about him. What I'm trying to get at is that a lot of the villains in JoJo, even in future parts, will often hide themselves to some degree or another. While stand users will inevitably come crossing each other's paths, that doesn't stop the villains from hiding themselves from the heroes or enemy stand users. Diavolo is probably one of the more extreme ones, well, save for maybe... 
I don't get it. But that's probably for another video at another time. We're talking about the man who was willing to go so far to protect his identity that he was willing to kill his only daughter so people couldn't trace him from her. Man, this should have been the video with the surf shark ad so I can make a joke about not having to pay such a heavy price so you could hide your identity. God, I'm such an idiot. Regardless of your narrator's intelligence level, I will fully admit that Diavolo is not exactly the most discussed of villains mainly due to the fact that his character is to be a mystery. That's the point. Of a man whose goal is to not exist in the mind of others but controlling the world of crime from the shadows. In a sense, Diavolo's motivation is actually similar to that of Kira's, to indulge in his vice and not have a worry in the world because of it. It's a shame since the aspect of mystery of Diavolo is extremely dangerous. In comparison to Dio and Kira, with Dio, we and the heroes know exactly who Dio is. But the true measure of his abilities were what made the Joestar Egyptian tour group wary of Dio and try to hurry up to kill him when they were in his lair. In contrast with Kira, while we the audience know his abilities and when he adopts a new identity, we are aware of what he looks like, the Mario group doesn't know this. Diavolo is actually a combination of both those mysterious elements. Where we as the audience and the characters don't know what he looks like or what his abilities are, at least not until it's too late. Even after we see his abilities, we still don't know exactly who Diavolo is. <laughs> Although, the dopio scenes do kind of give away that something isn't quite right. God, what a freak. Yeah, we'll be talking a little bit about Dopio in this too. I mean, the two are essentially two sides of the same coin. However, we as the audience do get to learn more about the character, about how his birth was nearly impossible, about how he was born in an all-female prison with no father of a two-year pregnancy. Not that it really matters in the grand scheme of things, in the overall plot of Jojo, when he was 19, he had faked his own death, all the while killing a few other people in the process. What'd he do after that? Well, he decided to go to Egypt, for some reason, to join excavation. Well, he was the one who did find the arrowheads that allow people to gain the power of stands, selling most of them, save for one, for great money, and then formed the Passion when he returned to Italy. It's not really a lot to be learned about Diavolo, at least with the official material. There's a lot of fan theories, but as we stay on this channel multiple times, theories are just theories. Nothing more, nothing less. But for now, we'll be referring to what makes Diavolo to be a threat. For a moment, is anyone worthier? Can you name even one person? You know that I alone am worthy of becoming king! One of the key elements that I've said in all my videos is that to have an effective villain, you need to be able to have them be a threat, especially if they're intended to be that way. If they're not threatening, what's the point? If the heroes aren't going to take the villain seriously, why should the audience? This ties into the point I made in the last segment, that Diavolo has a unique situation in Jojo, and it's one of his greatest strengths, that if you don't know who he is, you'd never be able to defeat him because of his Stan's ability. Which hey, since I brought it up, we might as well talk about his Stan's abilities before we get to his proper introduction. Diavolo's Stan, King Crimson, has two prominent abilities, the ability to race time for up to 10 seconds, and his ability to see in the future. Although that second one is due to his sub-Stan called Epitaph. Two stand abilities work in tandem with each other. Epitaph forecasts the future, projecting Diavolo's hair. Whatever his stand projects is 100% fated to happen. And this is where his main stand ability comes into play. King Crimson. King Crimson! That allows him to skip time up to 10 seconds. When activated, all will move along the predestined paths that were projected by Epitaph. Everyone but Diavolo himself. Everyone affected will have no control on what they will do during the time skip, and will have no memory of what happened. Diavolo, on the other hand, is free to move wherever he wants. In return, he cannot interact with anything. He essentially phases through it, and anything he interacts with will ignore him. He's immune from physical attacks and cannot attack anyone during the time skip. In that case, he basically just repositions himself for strategic purposes. The best example would be when he's fighting Bucciarati. Since he was able to keep himself hidden from view with only his stand actually being fully visible to the character and the audience at the time. And this power actually works extremely well with a character like Diavolo. Diavolo's nature is that of a paranoid person and one of the aspects of paranoia is the anticipatory fear of the unknown. So with the power of Epitaph, Diavolo can plan ahead and change his strategies. Considering some of his personality traits, this is especially fitting so he wouldn't have to worry about what'll happen to him. Without this power, Diavolo would be a lot easier to catch off guard, since he does seem to be pretty reliant on its powers to predict his opponent's moves. It can also be symbolic of the fact that Diavolo was actually pretty short-sighted, despite his long-term plans. There's also the fact that these two abilities can be used in collaboration. Epitaph on its own predicts the future, and what happens in that 10 seconds of time is set in stone. But when used with time skip, 
Diavolo can avoid the prediction's outcome entirely. Diavolo claims that this is all due to fate. For the 10 second time skipped, everyone but him follows their fates to the letter. To point out there were some discrepancies with how King Crimson actually worked due to how the manga had portrayed it, but the anime has managed to clear up a few misconceptions. At least that's how I figured in my research. But when you couple this with his personality and secretive nature, it's a deadly combination that works well to his advantage. When you look towards some of the previous villains with their stance and consider their powers, they match pretty well with the villain's personalities. Dio viewed himself to be above all mankind, and he wasn't wrong, and a power that effectively could shut down other stands and anything else fits with a man who sees himself as the greatest living organism in the world. Kira, on the other hand, was a man who wanted to live a quiet life while indulging in his personality vices. As such, Killer Queen had the ability to create bombs in secret as well as remove any sort of trace of who Kiro really was. Diavolo is in the same vein with his powers, which not only allow him to see into the future, but also properly plan for it, so he could effectively keep his identity secret. To be fair, Diavolo is quite the coward. He believes that the past, no matter how insignificant it may seem, can be used against someone. As such, he does everything he can to protect his identity and preserve his anonymity, including trying to kill his own child. It's because of this cowardice and paranoia that spurs Diavolo into becoming frantic. It's almost like a cornered animal, and because of that desperation, they will lash out worse than you would think. It's why when the Hitman team, when they asked for territory and a raise, Diavolo turned them down. They began to search for his information. One of their members, Sorbet, was sliced up alive and the other, Gelato, committed suicide. By sending this message, Sorbet's body was frozen in formaldehyde and framed, sent to the Hitman team. Truly a gruesome message. It should be noted that Diavolo actually managed to get quite a few kills due to his short-sighted tactics, however. He managed to kill Bucciarati, Abakio, and Narancia. In addition to Polnareff, if you want to throw in Dopio, he defeated Rosetto, technically. There's a lot to be said about Diavolo's abilities, but then there's also Dopio, a second skin as it were, which is a fictional version of DID, Dissociative Identity Disorder, or as some people like to view it a long time ago, multiple personalities. I need to make it clear that it's a fictional version of this, since I'm pretty sure DID doesn't change a person's height and body type. Now, I'm not here to talk about if it's a proper representation of the disorder. I'm pretty sure that the source that Araki used for the story was outdated anyway, so you can't really look for much realism, especially with the inclusion of the physical changes when alters change. I'm pretty sure this isn't a symptom of a disorder. I just want to make it clear I'm not a psychologist, nor is this the point of the video. So, please don't get in my case for that. Instead, the fact is that he has an alternate personality to use to his advantage. Since Dopio tends to be a really loyal person to Diavolo, the mob boss can use another skin to walk around in the day. Hell, the fact that Dopio seems more innocent as a character also plays into that, since people often view that as someone who couldn't possibly be related to the boss and yet Abakio faced that same challenge. So there's a lot of potential for Diavolo to be a villain who utilizes abilities to do so. However, like a lot of villains, he has his own weaknesses, and that comes from his... What are all these dragons made of metal? There is a recurring element in JoJo, and that is fate. There are many characters in the series of JoJo that will often reference fate such as no matter how strong or weak, all stand users are destined to meet one another. That's a fact. Diavolo is no different. It's an obsession of his, where he believes that it guides his life and that fate can control the action of all things, and that he is the one who can control that. Consider, if you will, that there are fortune tellers within the story of Jojo's Bizarre Adventure, and oftentimes they are considered to be a lot more credible in the world of Jojo. And as we've stated in the last part, one of Diavolo's powers is that he can see about 10 seconds into the future. And there are multiple times where Diavolo will say that it's his fate, or that he's assured of his victory. But it's not defeat! It may not be now, but victory will be mine! I'm coming to crush your skull properly this time, as fate ordained! The future can only hold one of us, and it has chosen me! But considering my last line in the previous section, this raises the question, this is a weakness? Well, yeah. Every one of the villains in JoJo has a weakness, and oftentimes it has to do with their own personality quirks, and it comes from egotism as well. Dio and Cars believed that they were the greatest creatures in the world. Kira shouted his name when he believed that he had conquered his enemies, and later on Poochie would believe that his ability to predict all actions that would happen led him to his death at the hands of a stand that had almost once defeated him before. Diavolo is no different, as his arrogance and belief in his ability to accept what fate sets before him unironically caused him to make some very serious mistakes. 
Let's take, for example, the arrows. One could argue that it was fate that guided Diavolo to find the arrows that he sold all but one, and then he gave that one to one of his lackeys to create new stand use. Why is this an issue? It plays into Diavolo's short-sightedness. Without thinking on testing them beyond getting a stand and recruits because of this, later on, this decision would create a stand that would defeat him. <laughs> and his attempts to go back on that decision in the last part of the fight would lead to his final defeat. He already had the arrow in his hands many years ago, but due to him wanting to get results immediately, it cost him the possibility to get a greater power. The Hitman team merely asked for a raise in some territory, something that pretty much every other team in the Pasión had, and Diavolo said no. And while killing Sorbet and Gelato sent a clear message to not search for his identity, simply trying to work with a very competent, effective, and dangerous assassin assassin team would have been a much better compromise and would have netted him a stronger and more loyal team. Instead of waiting for Trish to be delivered to him, as was the plan, and when Bucciarati's gone, Diavolo could kill Trish on his own time. The mob boss just decides to snatch her away from Bucciarati at the last second. Sure, Diavolo does have the power to kill Bucciarati, and does so. It saved him a headache, however, especially when he's well aware of Bucciarati's nature and skill as a stand user, as well as pretty much everyone else who's outside the building. I gloved up! There are a number of other things that we have to consider with this, but these are some of the bigger issues of Diavolo's short-sightedness, and it goes into play with his fatal character flaw, how he's willing to get short-term success without considering the long-term ramifications of his decision. Now, am I saying this makes him a bad villain? No. No, I am not. Just because a villain makes mistakes like these, that doesn't mean that they're a bad character. The fact that a lot of these issues stem from Diavolo's paranoia add to his humanization. While his motivations for starting the Passion are exactly clear, we do need to consider that before he went to Egypt, he did effectively destroy his identity and lit a town on fire because of it. So ever since then, the shadow of paranoia of someone possibly discovering him and his crimes could be considered to be clawing at his back. That's understandable when you consider that Diavolo didn't just go for the short-term wins, and had thought out his situations more, he'd probably be a lot more successful as a villain. Then again, if we looked at any of the villains and point out their flaws in hindsight, and as an outside third party who isn't actually part of the story, anyone can make these observations. Hell, one could easily argue that there was a great risk to testing the arrow on a stand, since not every person who gets stabbed with the arrow becomes a stand user. Some of them die, or it wouldn't even be possible to do so, considering that stands aren't exactly made of physical material. The reason I'm bringing these up is to talk about the character flaw, his paranoia, his short-sighted decisions, and his obsession with fate do blind him to the issues that his plans would spawn. It's a mixture of personal issues which can cause Diavolo to perform some seriously terrible acts, and at the same time open up to a lot more issues and problems in the future. And I honestly think that's pretty good. I think it's humanizing that he makes mistakes like this. It doesn't mean he's a bad villain, it just means that he's a very troubled person. I get it! I get jokes! <laughs> when I make my videos talking about villains, one of my favorite parts is when I make a comparison to the protagonists of their series, and if they act as a good foil. Because when you look towards a hero, you need to look towards their villain or antagonist as well, since the point of a hero is to have them challenged in the story, not just physically, not just through combat, but also through characterization. We love to watch heroes overcome the challenges thrown towards them, and villains are a great way of doing that. Jojo is a bit of a different beast when it comes to the style of hero's journey, especially when it comes to its protagonists. A good portion of the time, while the heroes are challenged in fights and such, there isn't really great development cycle for the characters to grow, at least a good portion of the time. I do not want to come off as if I'm generalizing the entire work in that regard, because there's a lot of development for many characters. But in part 5, part of the reason why Jorno to shine as a protagonist is because he's so gung-ho about his goal about becoming a gang star. If you're not familiar with Giorno's backstory, the kid didn't really have a happy childhood. He was neglected by his mother, abused by his second father, was bullied relentlessly for being a foreigner, oh, and was the son of Dio. <laughs> I know that sounds like an afterthought, especially considering that Dio was one of the most iconic villains in JoJo, but that's because it was an afterthought, and never really ties into the actual plot or story of Part 5. That's for a different video down the line, though. 
I mean, if you want that video, please consider typing in the comments, Golden Wind, and give this video a like. Once you do, we'll make a video talking about everyone's book, Golden Boy, Giorno Giovanna, when we hit 10k likes. Shilling aside, the point I'm trying to get at was that Giorno had a very rough childhood, and it wasn't until he actually found his dream after helping a gangster escape from death that things managed to turn around for him, and it was his inspiration to go out and seek his dream. If you think about it, Giorno is willing to do whatever he can to fulfill his dream, even putting himself in the line of fire. You know, standard fare for a heroic character. Meanwhile, in comparison to that of Diavolo, a character who did actually grow up in a rather privileged location, Diavolo is a coward. Giorno throughout the series is willing to take risks and gambles, relying on his teammates numerous times to get the job done if he can't do it. Diavolo, on the other hand, is willing to use anyone and everyone as a tool, prepared to destroy them if they fail him or go against him. In addition, while he's not afraid to sully his own hands with these deeds, he does so more in the shadows, only forced out into the open when he has no other choice in the matter. One could even argue that Diavolo is a foil to the rest of the main cast of Part 5, as each of them had their own terrible pasts but managed to get ahead of it because they worked together. This then ties into another aspect that goes well with the characters in Diavolo, a good foil to each other. And that, my friends, is trust. Diavolo is a paranoid megalomaniac who only cares about himself, with his fascination over fate honestly causing him to make mistakes or to outright deny the fate that he fails to see. Then you look over at Team Bucciarati, a team that is filled with misfits, each of them with their own terrible fates that were shackled onto them. But the team has a great level of trust between them all, with trust being a very necessary aspect, especially in the world of the Mafia. If you read or watch Team Bucciarati, it's pretty evident that trust is a major component on how they work. Kabakia. I hope for all our sakes, you're not letting a hang-up get in the way of survival. I can't reveal my stand to just anyone, especially a complete stranger who has zero loyalty to me. And one of the key traits to Giorno's story is to gain the trust of the crew. Come what may, I refuse to give up my dream. What the hell does that mean? Go on! Solve it then! Don't let me down! Giorno! Whereas Diavolo has no trust in those around him, Giorno opens himself up to the group, even going so far as to risk his life so he can gain the trust of them. Also, drinking piss, but that's neither here or there. Sure, he's doing it for the sake of his dream, but as the story goes on, we see that Giorno generally does care for the Bucciarati group. That's now in your skull! I win! <laughs> Determination. It shines even brighter than the morning sun. And it's put us on the path toward tomorrow. We've won because of you. What the hell? It's a genuine bond, and that's something that Diavolo refuses himself to have. Even with his right hand and altered persona, Dopio gets tossed away to die, leaving Diavolo all alone to try to acquire the arrow. And it really was a combination of the remainder of Team Bucciarati that managed to get the arrow to Giorno and allowing to evolve his stand into Requiem. I like to think that this is an interesting way to consider the dynamic between Giorno and Diavolo, especially since they don't really get a lot of characterization with each other. Which is probably the best way you can do this sort of thing, considering that Diavolo's goal is to remain hidden and as well matches paranoia. For those who don't know about paranoia, one of the more common definitions is as such, suspicion or distrust of others. And as you can imagine, it makes it very hard to have confidence with other people, so Diavolo built up walls around him so he could protect himself. All the while, Giorno lowered whatever walls he had in order to earn the trust of Team Bucciarati and in turn, he could trust them, much like how he puts his faith into Bucciarati himself. There are other parallels that one could make, such as how we're shown that while Giorno is quite strong, he's pretty much quiet as a protagonist. In fact, that's probably one of the major issues that a lot of people have with Giorno, that he's kind of bland. He doesn't really boast all that much, and in comparison, Diavolo has such a twisted ego that he actually believes that fate is on his side, even to the point where he feels like he's entitled to the power, making plenty of speeches about it. It's his destiny! Or look towards their stand abilities. Much like how Josuke and Kira's powers were opposing, one could view the same between Giorno and Diavolo. Giorno's gold experience has a similar healing utility of that of Josuke crazy diamond. However, not only does it allow Giorno to use it on himself, but he can also technically bring back the dead, uh, albeit temporarily. One could even consider that going against fate, again, temporarily. Gold Experience's main ability is to give life, and that could be seen as a selfless act incorporated into a stand. Meanwhile, King Crimson has a similar effect that allows him to bypass fate, or in Diavolo's mind, control it. 
Ultimately, it's a selfish power. As the world itself practically freezes and Diavolo can position himself wherever he wants in those precious few seconds. It's even funnier when you realize that Time Erasure cannot directly control the world while he erases the time. He can only position himself, meaning it's only focused on him. A completely selfish power. You could obviously say I'm stretching with these. But, I don't know, I think these are rather fun ideas to consider when you're looking at a villain and a hero and how they can contrast with each other, even down to their abilities, design, and concepts. Think fast, chuckle nuts! Diavolo was a contentious villain, and it's mostly due to his mysterious nature. On one hand, the concept of a villain so powerful that he hides his presence from everyone and he could potentially be the person next to you is an element that even the part played with. Rice Pirate! But by that same token, a lot of people see Diavolo as a villain with less personality, not helped by the fact that we don't really get a lot of insight in how he is the way he is. Even more so, as the split personality element between him and Dopio isn't exactly expanded upon, and is more or less left up to mystery as well. That isn't a bad thing per se, since not every villain needs to have a backstory that is so tightly woven that there's no actual debate to be had about the character. Frankly speaking, while looking for research for this video, there were a lot of things that did open my eyes to not only Diavolo as a villain, but Part 5 as a whole. Diavolo, the devil, his stand is terrifying and his behavior is unpredictable, and when re-watching and re-reading it makes you really consider how that made him a very scary villain and to think about. I love how his two stands are references to the band King Crimson in the song of their first album, Epitaph. And if you want to go even further than that, you can talk about how Diavolo himself is a 21st century schizoid man, which is the first track on that same album. Oh, well, Rocky, your musical references never cease to amaze me. There is a lot to talk about with the villains of JoJo's Bizarre Adventure, and I'm glad people are at the very least enjoying the videos that I talk about them. So, I guess the only thing I can say now is, I'm Manga Khan, and thanks for watching, and Arrivederci!